So, um, so we're going to talk about non-traditional grading systems, and there's a wide variety of these and lots of variations within those. Um, one of the things I'd like to start with is just thinking about what do you enjoy most about teaching and what you enjoy least. Any thoughts about what you least enjoy, perhaps first? Probably grading. <laughs> that's uh, not, you know, that's what people normally say. Yeah, um, and you know, not having students not pass and you know move on to the next level. I teach math. I just started teaching math there as an adjunct. Okay. And Steve, would you agree? Yeah, I, I, um, I just really don't like grading. I, I don't like putting marks on student work. I, I, I didn't hear exactly what she said, agree with. I, I apologize, but I, I also hate grading, but for a lot of reasons. Honestly, because part of it is the effort that it takes. The time that it takes and deciding whether you get give someone five points or four points or something. Exactly. And, and struggling over those details. And then often maybe dealing with the feedback from students who argue that they really did do better than your grade suggests or something similar. Um, well, for me, it's, you know, giving them the kind of detailed feedback, you know, even on like a draft and then them taking that feedback absolutely nowhere. Because yeah. <laughs> you know, then it's like, oh, I put in all this effort and now it's gone yeah. to nothing. And when you look at what students do with their work that on graded items, if they do poorly, generally they'll just discard it and not look at it again based on surveys. And I've had students when I gave back exams where someone did really poorly, on their way out, they drop it in the trash can after I spent a lot of time giving them feedback on some of the work. Um, when you think about what people most enjoy, you know, what aspects of teaching do we enjoy the most? I love the collaboration like with students and just kind of different, having those discussions or different perspectives. But I really like when I see kind of the aha moment and they and they kind of get, they start to make connections and stuff. It's cool to see that. Mm -hmm. Seeing students learn and yeah. grow and become more proficient and actually do something yeah. with the material they're learning in the class. John, just let me say quickly, I don't know about the others listening on Zoom, but for me, it's very difficult to hear anyone in the room speaking besides you. Oh, you know, I bet. Let me just make sure we've got the right devices hooked up. I know what happened. Um, our microphone is not correct. Let me go to um, audio interface. Okay, we're using a new setup. Not yet. Yes. No. Now is it better? Is it better? Can you hear us? Can you hear yes, us? Yeah, I, now I, I can. can. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Okay, it was using the laptop microphone. Oh, it defaulted oh. to that. The We changed our technology yesterday yeah. because we were having an issue with two of the mics not working mm. through the mixer. And I thought it would default to the same setting by turning on, but there's a few more steps that we will make sure we use in the future uh, unless we get the other thing fixed. Thank but, you for letting us know. Yeah. yeah, thank you, because this would have continued for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so what most people seem to say when we ask, when I ask this question, is they like interaction with students, seeing mm -hmm. students get that, those aha moments and so forth. Um, so Ken Bain distinguishes three, uh, three different groups of learners, strategic learners and surface learners, and deep learners. And what would you guess strategic learners are if you haven't read Ken Bain's stuff on this? I would guess that a strategic learner is a student or learner that, um, you know, is really focused on a particular like subset of content kind of depending on the course? It's, it's close. close. They're specific. They're focusing on something specifically, but it's not necessarily the actual learning. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. I was gonna, yeah, I was going to say, I have a particular student last semester that comes to mind that I, I 
maybe thing could have been strategic. Um, he really was just, every time he came in, he was trying to get that every little extra bit of a grade that he could, even though maybe ah, he okay. didn't deserve it. Exactly. And so what he's suggesting, <laughs> what he suggests is that a lot of students see education as a search for points, mm -hmm. a search to get the mm -hmm. highest GPA so that they're able to have really strong recommendations and so forth. But the focus is entirely on getting the highest grades, mm -hmm. not necessarily on learning. And, you know, a lot of students will see it this way, that when they take their first test, they're trying to figure out what the instructor is evaluating and so forth. And they see it essentially as a game, not necessarily getting the most learning out of the course, but finding ways in which they can get the highest possible grade, whether or not they actually learn anything. Surface learners are people who basically want to do well enough to pass a course so they don't ever have to deal with it again. We see a lot of those in gen ed classes. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of that in introductory economics mm -hmm. where they just want to breeze through without doing a lot, but getting enough so that they don't have to take the course again, but not much more than that necessarily. Deep learners are people who really want to understand the content. And that's what we really want to encourage. But one of the problems is that our system of elementary and secondary education really encourage students to be strategic or maybe surface learners. That you know, students have gone through a lot of high stakes exams. They've been evaluated based on their grades and not necessarily how much they've learned. Mm -hmm. One would hope there's some connection between those, but a lot of the strategies that students use really don't result in long-term recall. Mm -hmm. They result in high grades on exams. And we'll talk about that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and one of the issues and and one of the reasons why these non-traditional alternative grading systems are becoming more common is because of concerns that the focus on grades tends to perhaps shift the focus from learning and to and playing this game of getting the highest grades. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of evidence of that. And one is the practices that students use that when students are asked whether that how they study or how they get ready for an exam or a high stakes assessment, they tend to just read things over and over again. They work through perhaps the same problems over and over again. They, um, and they tend to do a lot of cramming. And the research on that suggests that none of those strategies tend to lead to long-term recall, but they are very effective in getting higher grades. So they're very good in encouraging, you know, that sort of, um, well, grade focus, but not necessarily very good in encouraging long-term recall and the ability to take concepts and transfer them to other areas. And one of the things that we do know is that getting feedback on what they're learning is really important for learning, but advocates of alternative grading systems suggest that grades are not essential, but feedback is. And there's a whole range of alternative ways of doing that. Um, and one of the points that many of these advocates suggest is that we didn't always use grades, mm -hmm. that the 100 point grading scale was first introduced in Harvard in 1837. Mm -hmm. The 4.0 scale that we use was first introduced at Yale in 1813. And there were four Latin names for the four levels. It wasn't A, B, C, you know, and so forth later, or I'm sorry, that would be more than four, but uh, the 4.0, 3.0, 2.0, and 1.0 originally just had Latin terms, which I don't even remember yeah. at this point. But the main point is for much of human history, grades did not exist in any educational system. Students got some feedback and they got some evaluations of the work, but they didn't necessarily have grades. And we're going to talk about some ways of shifting to slightly different perspectives from the most minor changes to more dramatic changes. And probably the simplest way of revising a grade strategy or is using some form of a mastery learning approach where basically students work on topics until they master that. You, they're given either a limited number or an unlimited number of opportunities to demonstrate learning on some type of an exam or assessment and only the highest grade is recorded. That used to require a tremendous amount of work from instructors in grading that, but to the extent to which you can do that with, with software or with um, web-based tools, it makes it a whole lot 
less difficult. There are challenges in terms of academic integrity issues, but if you can have students, if students are faced with a wide variety of questions on a topic and they're allowed to try them a, a large number of times, perhaps even an infinite number of times, um, they and you only hold the highest grade, it gives them an incentive to work through material until they master it. And that can be done in a very low stakes way. In fact, any given attempt would be effectively a no stakes attempt if they, um, again, if they, if you keep only the highest grade. So, but there, there are some challenges with this. One is if you're going to create questions for this, if it's going to be computer graded, it could take a lot of time to create those questions. If you're going to use a test bank provided by the publisher, most of the time, probably 90, 95% of those questions will appear on Chegg and other services within a couple of weeks of their release if it's mm -hmm. a widely adopted textbook. Um, and there are ways of discouraging that. One is perhaps by limiting the amount of time students have, and there's some concerns there. Um, another way, if you're dealing with a STEM-related field, if, if you're dealing with applied problems, you can have algorithmic questions where students are faced with the same basic problem, but they get different parameters that they have to use each, each attempt so that they have to at least master the, the concept before you can move on. Um, if you're going to do something that's a bit more qualitative, if you're going to have students write essays and so forth, it's a bit more challenging to use a mastery learning approach because someone has to evaluate it. But one way of doing that perhaps is by using um, peer evaluations for at least some of the feedback. Um, so that's one approach. Um, Another approach is to use an adaptive learning platform, which is designed basically to do this automatically. And the advantage of using an adaptive learning uh, platform, and there's a growing number of those out there, and many of them are available, and many options are available for free within SUNY because we have a contract with Lumen Learning, and with um, which also has in turn a con uh, contract with OLI from Carnegie Mellon. So we've got dozens, maybe maybe even a hundred or more uh, adaptive learning platforms that we could readily introduce, which is basically a prepackaged course, which has some readings that students do, then they're faced with questions. Well, I'm sorry. Typically what happens is students in a given module are faced with a pretest, they're, um, they, which gives them some information on what they already know, and it shapes their initial learning path. And then they're given some readings, based on the level that they come in at on that particular topic. And then they're given problems that are appropriate for their level of understanding, and it builds to progressively higher levels. What that means is that students with weaker backgrounds, which many of our students have given the schools they come from, um, it requires more work. But for students who already come in knowing more, it allows them to move on to more advanced topics more rapidly. So, it's a nice way of doing it, which takes a lot of the work of, but takes all of the work of building the system out of our hands and puts it in the hands of the developers of these programs. Um, and there's some really good ones. Um, it lets students focus their time outside of class on the areas where they need the most work. Um, and it builds in retrieval practice, which is one of the ways that increases long-term recall. And students don't always like this because they rather not have to take quizzes over and over again, but it's a really effective way of building mastery. And again, the key is doing it in a way that encourages students to learn the material without discouraging them and without us having to do a lot of work uh, grading them. So it's the simplest thing. It's basically taking what most of us already do and breaking it up into small chunks and giving students lots of practice with it. Mm -hmm. The next step up in terms of shifting away from traditional grading is specifications grading. And with specifications grading, what you do is you build a series of assignments with very clearly specified requirements. It could be in the form of a rubric or just a detailed description of the assignment with lots of structure. And then any assignment that students turn in are graded on a pass-fail basis. Typically, multiple attempts are allowed. Uh, Linda Nielsen, who developed the specifications grading system, suggests that students be given a certain number of tokens so that they can 
there's a limit to the number of retemps they can take throughout the course, but you can give them some tokens so that if they do poorly on something, which is more likely early in the class, she suggests, uh, and it becomes less of an issue later on, it's, it's much simpler in terms of grading. You set, she argues that you set the minimum accepted standard at a level that you would consider to be a B. So that essentially students are told what they need to show, what they need to demonstrate. And again, typically with a rubric, and then they either pass it or they don't. And you give them feedback, which allows them to submit an additional attempt. The number of attempts you give, again, depends on class size and the amount of time you have and the complexity of the assignment. But the key is you're giving students a chance to try something, make a mistake, learn from that, and try again, at least on some of the assignments. Um, if you give enough assignments in a lower stakes, you may not have to give very many of those because students will learn as they move through. And then the grade is determined either by the number of assignments successfully completed, or you could set different bundles of assignments for different levels, which is sort of like a contract grading system where to get an A, they have to do this bundle of specification graded assignments. If for a B, they may do a somewhat lower level. So for example, you might have an assignment which requires quite a bit more work in terms of writing a paper or creating a more elaborate review of the literature or something similar uh, in order to get an A. You may have a different specification required to get a B. But the key is you never have to worry about students arguing whether that essay they turned in was worth an 83 or an 87 or something similar. It shifts the focus away to grades to focusing on mastering the content. And it's, it's not much different than what we normally do, but again, it does shift the focus to attaining the learning objectives away from the number of points that they get. And you know, a good way of doing this is having students do some of the more elaborate projects in a, in a sequence where they're turning in things and they only get feedback until they turn in the final project. So you know they, they got steered in a direction that will allow them to be successful. Um, so any questions on that? Okay. Um, so the next type of thing, which is often combined with specs grading, is contract grading or labor-based grading. Um, and basically with contract grading, the student and the instructor agrees to a contract in which each grade is tied to a specific set of criteria. And the things you might include is the number of allowed absences, the number of drafts, papers, or assignments completed in a satisfactory manner, which is very similar to specs grading. Mm -hmm. um, it could be the number of reading responses they turn in, where you could give them a list of readings, and they get a grade based on how many of those they submit during the course of the term, which is agreed to upfront. Um, and the argument basically is that by knowing exactly what they have to do and students can keep track of their progress through this. Um, the, there are some concerns. One is that students won't really get know their final grade until the end. And that sort of feedback could encourage them to postpone some of the work. So you may want to, if you're doing this, think about putting in deadlines along the way because we all tend to procrastinate and students know less than faculty. And you know, by at least requiring some spacing of this, it's going to result in higher quality work in general. But um, Labor-based grading is um, taking us to a little bit further extreme where basically you just grade people based on the amount of labor they put into it, not necessarily on the quality of the work. So it's subject to a minimum acceptable quality, but basically students just have to complete a certain number of things and this is commonly used in composition classes, for example, where just the practice of writing allows you to get better at it. And for many of us in areas where we're used to putting more numeric scores and so forth, where we want students to master things, you know, we, I remember years ago, one of my colleagues had a student come in and complain that, you know, he's failing the course and yet he had spent five hours studying for the test. And his response to it was, well, if you go into a restaurant and you order a really nice meal and it comes out burnt, would you 
how would you <laughs> respond if the chef spent well, I spent two hours cooking this meal. You know, this was a lot of labor, bait, a lot of work put into this. And I think about that a little bit sometimes when I hear about labor-based grading, that we do want students to meet minimum standards, but again, that can be built into the structure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by setting some minimum acceptable standard and having students do a certain amount of work, it can encourage learning. And we do know that we learn by doing, and it shifts the focus from the grade to just the process of working through the assignments. And, you know, for example, when we have physicians learning, a lot of, some of their time is spent in the classroom where they're graded, but a lot of the time is spent when they're doing internships and residency, and they're just learning by doing. You know, and we do the same thing with plumbers and with electricians and so forth. A lot of their learning is just time spent on the job doing things, and in some disciplines, for some assignments, this might not be a bad way of doing it. Certainly with musicians, the more time you spend practicing and the more time you spend learning, the more you learn. So there are cases where this can really work well. I, I'm not sure I would do this in, in economics. I'm not sure I would do that in math or engineering, but for some areas, it could be really helpful. So like the allowed absences one. So I do do that with my students. Like they, they are allowed three, I call them freebies in a sense. And of course, other things that are in our, um, that our institution allows like religious reasons and things like that. Of course, those are unexcused, right? Or those are excused, excuse me. Um, but the allowed absences, so it's kind of a, a contract um, and they do a, see every day how many they've accrued and, and things like that. But the grade, they don't see it until the end, but I do email them and let them know. But what I have noticed with doing my attendance like this is that students at the end, when they realize that they've passed or passed the three, they come back with all of these excuses as to why those were, those should be excused absences. So I run into that, um, but otherwise it does work. I mean, it's, it's more so my first year courses that struggle with this. Um, more of my upper division are pretty good and people are in class and, and prepared. Um, yeah. But uh, I've been trying to avoid that unsuccessfully by not, um, <laughs> by not directly using absences, but mm -hmm. I do do daily clicker quizzes. And I teach clicker a class quizzes, yeah. in the fall right. where I have the most issues mm -hmm. with this on Tuesday and Thursday. And I generally allow five absences. I drop the five lowest clicker scores. Mm -hmm. So they're able to miss two and a half weeks for any reason mm -hmm. uh, without needing to, well, without basically any penalty. Yeah. And even if they miss more, you know, this is done every day and it's not yeah. going to make much of a difference if they miss a couple more than that. Yeah, um, yeah cause I was but, thinking about increasing. But I still have two. students come in and saying, well, I had missed these five, but now I have a legitimate excuse for this six and seven paths. Right. And my response is, well, you know, everyone has exactly the same criteria, uh, you perhaps, you know, may have considered the need for these later when you right. chose not to attend for the first two or three weeks, well, for when you missed right. five so, classes yeah. in your first month of the class. Right. Um, and I also offer them the option of attending over Zoom. Uh, so they really don't have much of an excuse unless they're in a place without Wi-Fi. Yeah. And I remind them of that. And, you know, I have had students participate from hospital rooms while they were traveling on a bus to a sports event and so forth. But right. um, but students will often argue that they need more. And I, up front, I tell them, everyone has the same absences. No one has to come in and explain it, you know why they couldn't be there if you can't be there for any reason you got two and a half weeks without right. any penalty so don't worry about it i wouldn't make an exception if someone was really hospitalized or mm -hmm. you know or had some serious other excuse but normally their excuses is you know i overslept or i just yeah, wasn't something. feeling that well for the a month or so uh or something similar and i said well if you're going to be missing that much you may want to consider dropping the class yeah. Um, so you say five is a good well I was I had three and I'm noticing that that's not well I had five and then enough. I had to go up to six because our network in uh in the building was was weak one day and oh, about okay. a third of the student couldn't connect yeah. so I ended up dropping six actually which weakened the case this past semester even okay. more mm -hmm. so they had three weeks yeah. free unless they happened to be affected then they still had two and a half yeah but um 
but th this is something that some people do you know argue yeah. I honestly, I don't want to take attendance in a class of three or four hundred oh, students. Oh yeah, right. uh, yeah, yeah. But the clickers smaller, is a so. nice proxy for it, and they're being made, they're being graded based on their answers and how they respond. Yeah. It's very low stakes. They they're yeah. essentially as long as they're there, they get a minimum score of sixty percent, and then they get between sixty and hundred based on how what proportion of the questions they answer correctly. So just being there gives them 60 percent on a given day even if they answer every question wrong yeah. um so it, it is a very low stakes activity mm -hmm. and on most of the questions they get two attempts first alone they get to discuss it and they try again but but yeah there are issues with with having allowed absences one of the problems is if you're going to give people additional absences when they come to you. Mm -hmm. Most students who are have some really good excuse for not being there won't necessarily come to you and ask for it. Yeah, the right. students who are most likely to ask for it are students who are continuing generation students, students who have more connections to other people who went to college yeah. and know that you can ask for those things. And that's a point I tend to make up front that I do provide lots of room for people who need to take time off or who can't be there for some legitimate reason, but that is open to everybody and you don't have to come and ask me for special circumstances or conditions. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with quizzes and exams. I drop the, at least one in every grade category where in most cases they have a grade a week on three or four different criteria. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a good way of making it somewhat equitable and allowing for, for concerns that come up. But well, it's worked well for me, except for those five or six students out of three or 400 yeah. who still argue that they really need an additional five or six absences because um, their car broke down or something. I don't know. Um, so ungrading is a more extreme approach. And this has been something that's been very much discussed in higher ed circles recently. And more and more people are trying. And a number of people on campus are experimenting with this. The goal is to shift the focus entirely away from grading to learning and students and you specify the learning objectives for the class and for any given assignments very clearly as you would with specs grading or contract grading. Um, and then you have students reflect on their learning as they go and you review their reflections and you provide them with feedback all the way through. So students are getting feedback on the work, but they're not getting grades. And so what happens is the only thing students have to respond to as they're working through projects is the feedback you're giving them on how they can improve their work. And so they shift their focus. So instead of being upset that they got a low grade, they see ways in which they can improve. People who use this, claim that it dramatically increases student motivation, student engagement, and they see much more improvement in student work than when they were using grading scales. Um, and you still have to assign grades. You know, here we have to assign grades for freshmen, and certainly we have to assign grades at the end of the term. And the way in which grades are assigned with an ungrading approach is through some type of negotiation between mm -hmm. individual students and the instructor. And the way in which this is typically done is that student you have you set up a, a Google form, students reflect on the learning, and they submit a grade preference and they justify it. They describe what they learned, mm -hmm. how much they've learned, how they've achieved the learning objectives. And you may have a number of questions in there, basically a grading rubric, and you ask them to rate themselves on this. And then you meet with the students and agree on a grade. Advocates of ungrading systems, when asked about this, whenever I've interviewed someone on the podcast who does ungrading, one of the questions we normally ask is something to the effect, well, what happens when students come in with the Dunning, well, the Dunning Kruger effect uh, type thing, where students who understand the topic the least often are most confident of their under understanding. And they say that that happens, but it's very rare. What they claim is that what's much more common is students would tend to understate the grade they should get. And in particular, they argue that that's true for women and for students from, minor from minoritized groups. And 
this is an opportunity to perhaps build a growth mindset when you work with a student individually mm-hmm. saying, well, I've looked through your work and I think it's better than you're rating it yourself. Um, you know, they, they say that sort of problem is and often they'll say it's three or four times more likely than it is that students mm-hmm. will come in overestimating their grades. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I can absolutely and, let, attest to that. I would say that, I mean, anecdotally again, um, but I had a class of almost entirely women um, in one of my sections and I'd say 90% of them undervalued their score. And so the way, and so I, I implemented ungrading in my course um, courses this past semester. And um, so when that did happen, which happened often for women and uh, students from marginalized communities that, um, you know, I would then kind of give my feedback on, you know, their, um, on their work throughout the course and then ask them if they wanted to change their grade um, that they had for themselves. And, and often they did. And then it was much closer to what, you know, I had in mind for, um, for their grades. So yeah, that, that was definitely, because I was much more worried about the Dunning-Kruger effect um but that that really didn't come up um and when we did have disagreements there were a couple students that we had slight disagreements with through the discussion that we had um it was settled really easily and very both parties were um you know i think satisfied in the Mm -hmm. end and that's the most common reaction from everyone i've talked to Mm -hmm. who moved to ungrading that you know they expect all these problems because we're used to students coming in and complaining about their grade, but then the focus that they've had all along is getting the highest possible grade in the class, a strategic learning mm-hmm. type thing. It, by shifting to ungrading, mm-hmm. you're shifting the focus entirely to what do you understand? What have you mastered? What do you still need to work on? And they're reflecting on that rather than reflecting on the grade. Mm-hmm. And by having them reflect on that throughout the semester, potentially at least you're improving their metacognition. So they're better able to evaluate how well they understand material, which would reduce the Dunning-Kruger effect. Mm-hmm. And the stereotype threat is, again, when people come in expecting perhaps to do less well, because that's been the experience of people with their characteristics in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, or So when you, when you do ungrading, right? How do you communicate that to the students like in a course syllabus or something? Is it similar to like, how do you go about that? Like if you choose one of these different, it's not. Yeah, so it was it was a lot of conversations throughout the semester. Okay, you know, okay. for, for me, you know, I definitely, I, I had it kind of laid out in the assignment description. Mm-hmm. Like, so this is the type of, uh, grading practice I'm yeah. going to use and it's called ungrading and you know it provided kind of a definition and we spent a lot of time in class kind of talking about it. why okay. we were making that shift mm-hmm. from a traditional grading approach and I thought again that it was going to be a lot more of me convincing students mm-hmm. to buy into this mm-hmm. because it was a senior seminar class and so presumably all of their classes prior to this you know had a traditional grading you know structure and and even if they didn't it might have been a you know lower level class and 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 such but it, the really the buy in came from me i had to convince myself mm-hmm. that i was i was happy with this grading system and in the end i was but you know i had a lot of you know fears and concerns about you know the way these kinds of conversations would 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 occur and the type of in and, and what the self assessments would would suggest and um, but in the end, you know, the students were really on board for it. Mm. You know, they, they really didn't seem to mind, like I didn't have any students, at least again, to my knowledge, maybe they did have their own anxieties about it, but none of them came to me to say, you know, I really am struggling with not knowing, you know, what my grade is in this moment. Um, they really, you know, I think the regular feedback, um, was, you know, particularly motivating. And, Mm -hmm. you know, when they finally got to the place where I said, I don't have any more feedback to give to you, they could, you know, take a breath and like, all right, 
we've done this, you know, we've, we've accomplished this. And so there, there was kind of moments throughout the semester where they kind of knew where they were, where they stood, depending on how they incorporated that mm. feedback. And yeah. so it sounds like something I could do like in with the internship too, because there's not as many yes. assignments anyway. It would be easy. Yeah. It's yeah. used mostly yeah. in humanities fields, but it's, mm -hmm. it's starting to spread in others. There's a book out of the collection of essays on ungrading, mm -hmm. um, which has contributions from math, from, uh, yeah. I think there's one other STEM field involved and from a wide variety of disciplines. And people have implemented it in various ways, but I haven't quite moved to it myself, but I have considered it. I have done some yeah. specs grading and some other things and certainly lots of low stakes grading, but I haven't fully moved to it. But again, the, partly because the class I teach in the fall has up to 400 students right. in it. Yeah. And I, it's scheduling long. interviews with 400 students would yeah. be a bit challenging. Mm -hmm. But much of the work, though, is selling students on this early on and mm -hmm. letting them know how it's going to work so that they don't have the anxiety of worrying about their grade mm -hmm. throughout it um, yeah. and explaining why you're doing it. And most people say students generally respond pretty well after mm -hmm. a little bit of initial resistance yeah. because they're used to the focus on grades. Mm -hmm. I think I may do that. Because I've wanted to meet with students in the internship process anyway, and we just haven't had, so this would be a good perfect yeah. opportunity to move to this and do that because of that discussion. Yeah, it's a, it was, I, I found the process intimidating, um, but it was worth it in the yeah. end. I really, yeah. you know, I, I really think it was um, worth it in the end. Everyone I've talked to, and I've talked to a few dozen people who've done this, have had the same response that yeah. they were initially anxious about mm -hmm. it, but they wouldn't go back in many cases. Yeah. Well, in any case of the people I've talked to. Yeah. So that's the most extreme way, I think, of changing. Yeah. And there's all sorts of combinations you can do of these. But I do have um, a resource here. Um, if you have a... Um, your camera, you can click on it, and it will take you to some of the basic resources on each of these topics, um, often by the people who develop them. Um, and and I, I will put the uh, URL in the chat. Um, but if I click on it, it's going to take me away from that. Everyone have the QR code if you're using that? Okay, so I'm gonna just go to there and open this up, and I will, well, I can drop the, this URL, and I. And there. And so there's a lot of things in here. SUNY actually, I put together a group at the SUNY level uh, investigating innovative assessments, assessments. And they work for two years actually. And they put together a group of resources um, on this from people more broadly and also collecting examples of it in a variety of disciplines. Their website is continually growing and there's more and more resources appearing there. Um, here is an Ed Surge podcast on mastery learning. Um, it's been around for decades. Um, Linda Nielsen developed specifications grading. Um, her book is probably the best reference to it, but we also did a podcast with her a couple of years ago. Um, here's a couple of articles on um, contract and labor-based grading, and here's some of the resources on ungrading. Um, uh, Susan Bloom's book, or Bloom and Cohn's book, on ungrading is probably the best resource because it provides examples in a variety of disciplines. Jesse Stommel has been one of the major advocates of this for quite a while now, but his, uh, his blog post on how to ungrade is probably the best description of it. Um, Josh Eiler has done quite a bit with it. He actually uses a mix he teaches in history, uh, although he was doing also a writing class that he discusses here, which is an ungrading approach, but that requires some level of contract grading. The way he does it is a certain minimum specifications that you have to meet or minimum requirements you have to meet in order to get a grade of a C plus or better. So you could get a C if you didn't meet the minimum threshold or lower, but in order to be able to engage in ungrading, you have to do a certain minimum amount of work. So it's sort of a combination of the contract and grading approach and an ungrading approach, which might be a little bit of a transition for people who aren't entirely comfortable with that. Um, 
and it also does set some minimal standards. Um, Kristen Blinney actually is at SUNY Oneonta. She wrote a really nice book on it. I didn't include a link to the book, partly because even the um, the Kindle version is like $60. It's a relatively expensive book. It's a very good book. Mm -hmm. uh, I did get it before interviewing her, but there she describes her work. And mm -hmm. we did a podcast a couple of years ago, like 2019. Wow. Uh, we did a podcast with Jesse Stommel, who talked about ungrading and other issues associated with grading. So um, there's a lot more resources, but this, this could help you get started if you want to explore more of these. So I wanted to open it for any discussion, comments, questions, thoughts, or things you tried that have worked well. I'll stop the share. Any thoughts? I'll just, just throw something out. Something that I've done that, and I actually kind of like it in employment law, where I really do think it's important for the students to understand the material, what I do is I give an exam and it's an open book exam because I tell them, if you are an HR manager or just working at a business, I don't want you trying to give students the answer to a, a question without, you know, researching it and coming, but in any event, so I use an open book exam and they're individual exams, but then I allow them to correct their exam and earn back half the points they missed. So, but when I then do that, I allow them to work together on those corrections because that way, like if, if John, if you didn't understand disparate impact or something like that, maybe, just, you know, somebody else can help you. Um, so I, I just, I just, throw that out as something that kind of has worked with for it's me. It's a really great type of assessment. What that's sometimes called two-stage exams, where students basically take the exam on their own, with or without, whether you do it open book or not is even a separate issue, but then you let them explain it to each other. And that peer instruction component is mm -hmm. really helpful because some students will understand it more deeply and the act of explaining it to other students help reinforce that knowledge, making it more likely they'll remember it long-term. Mm -hmm. And the students who are hearing it from other people who just learned it are hearing it from people at a similar level of development of their understanding, which often can be much more effective than hearing it from us because some of the things students find challenging seem obvious to us after we've been doing this, um, or when we start teaching, it becomes obvious pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But when you're just first learning it, there's a lot more processing you have to do. And peer instruction can help students get past that. Whether they already understand it or whether they don't, it benefits both groups really nicely. I did a two-stage exam after John had talked about it a few years back, and uh, my students really, really enjoyed it. They really got a lot out of it. It took, you know, a little bit longer because we had one class period where they took the exam. I had to turn around, grade all of those exams right in time for the next class period. Um, but it was, um, you know, I, I, I haven't... Truthfully, I don't think I've given an exam since then because <laughs> I've been teaching a lot of writing classes. So a lot of my assessments have been, you know, writing related and less um, exams. But, um, you know, that's definitely the way I, I want to keep moving forward. Yeah, when I first did it, the students were just so different because normally I first did, did it in my econometrics class and there would always be some students who do really well, some students who really struggled. And the, the day after I gave, when I was giving the exam back, usually the next class period, the students who did well would sit there, but not really process very much because they already understood it. The students who struggled, who didn't do so well on the test would get these really low grades and they wouldn't pay attention because they were upset that they had done so poorly. But when we did, when I did it, I did it in the classroom. You could also do this outside of class. But when they um, did it in the classroom and they were explaining it to each other, they were cheerful. They were excited about it. I didn't give them back their scores, so they didn't know how they did before they took the second mm -hmm. attempt, but they were arguing over things. And someone, I, I was listening to one, I was wandering around a little bit listening to it. And I heard one student say, 
but when did we go over that? And, or how, do, how can we do it? Yeah, I don't remember us ever doing this. And then another student said, well, remember when we had this problem, we had to apply this and we did this in class. And then the other said, oh yeah. <laughs> and you could see that those aha moments come mm -hmm. through. And when they were hearing it from their peers, it was just so much more positive and they learned so much more. And all, well, all except for one student, my first attempt doing it did better. One went from 100 down to like 98 because one of the other students convinced him he was wrong about one part of the thing. And I ended up letting him keep the score, but I did give him back the lower one. I said, well, look, you should be more confident, you know, that yeah. you understood this, you were right, argue for that a little bit more effectively. If you think you're right on something, you know, take a stand on it. Don't give in to your peers if they, if they don't quite get it. But overall, it was such a positive experience. It was mm -hmm. so much more fun. I actually took a video of that happening and I, Rebecca was the associate director at the time, and just a short video clip and sent it over saying, they're taking an exam. <laughs> it was just such a different experience. So mm -hmm. yeah, I strongly recommend that, Steve. John, let me ask you a question. It's not exactly related to grading, but and I'll ask you and I'll ask everybody if you have an idea on this. In um, my labor relations class, students have to decide, make decisions on labor relations cases. Like in other words, a union argues that management violated the law by doing X, Y, and Z. I would like them to be able to make the decisions like at a group of two or three because for example as you you may know that's what happens on the national labor relations board like it's, it's right. you know and they what i'm concerned the reason i don't and i hadn't done that in the past is i was afraid that if i had created a group of three people you know they could just say, well, Bill will do case one and George will do, and they won't do the cases that they don't, you know, that, how do you, do, do any of you have suggestions for how you could do something like that, but make sure that all people in the team have input to the case that they're deciding? Mm -hmm. This is not exactly the same, but when I have students work in groups in smaller classes, classes of 30 or 40, uh, I have them do it right in Google Drive where I create a group folder, which only the members of the group have access to. And I have them write in different colors. And so you can see the contributions of the individual members because at the top of the document, I tell them to put the color of their name so that their contributions will be directly visible. You could also look at the Google Doc edit history, but if they're sitting together and working on it at the same time, the person typing it may not be the person who you know, had actually made the contribution. But if they're sitting there and they're each typing parts of it or they're, they're editing each other's work, you can see how the work has evolved. Mm -hmm. That's one strategy. Um, you could also have students do um, evaluations of each other, but if they collaborate and, and they truly divide it up and they don't, yeah. and they all say, well, we all we worked equally on it, that breaks down. So direct observation, and in this case, by using the colors was a strategy that someone at Buffalo suggested on a similar project. And for me, it's worked pretty well. As long as there's enough color contract uh, crafts to meet accessibility. So, you know, if someone's using like a pale yellow on white, it doesn't work so well. <laughs> and sometimes that will happen. And I'll remind them, remember how we talked about making sure there's sufficient color contrast so that, you know, we can actually read the work, but, So uh, any other suggestions? I've done something similar with the Google, the Google Drive. I didn't have them do colors, but I could see um, they'd have their names and then, yeah, I could see who edited and who was in there doing stuff. So, and actually it helped in a scenario where there was a group issue of somebody who was not pulling their weight. So, and I could go in and see that that was, you know, effectively happening because they were not in the drive helping and things like that. So it's helped in that sense of, of group um, issues too. Um, so in other ways I've used, used it as well. Any other suggestions? I don't have anything, I don't believe. 
but I, I guess, you know, just um, overall, any of these, I think they're all worth a shot, you know, just to, you know, take the risk and see how it works. And, um, you know, I think, in, in, and I did this pre-tenure, which was a little, you know, uh, more worrisome, not that I, you know, expected it to totally flop, but I was a little nervous that it would totally flop and I would get totally, you know, um, um, you know, um, negative comments in my evaluations, but everything was still quite positive, which was, you know, reassuring. And one thing you can always do is question each group member, raise questions of each of them on some of the work. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't contribute to that part of it, they're going to be at a loss. So, you know, asking each one, maintaining some sort of um, requirement that students re be able to report on each yeah. part of each one of the cases that they looked at, for example, might be a way of, you know, resolving that. Thank Getting you all. Accountability. Any other questions or comments? We should probably end pretty shortly to get ready for the next session, but. Oh, just uh, thank you. Okay. I, you know, I teach, I teach math and it lends itself to mastery um, but i feel feedback is so important i spend a lot of time giving feedback on anything i give them and it's just i've thought many times how nice it would be just to give the feedback without any grade yeah you know like give the student the option of doing a particular assignment if you want to do it and get feedback on it and then that's your choice but there wouldn't be a grade assigned to it um, it takes pressure yeah. off from both us and from them. So you, you don't have to use your cognitive effort focusing on the grade. And you can say, look, these are the things you need to work on, or this is an area where you need to, mm -hmm. you know, investigate or explore further. Um, to move fully to one of these approaches, you could do ungrading on some assignments. You could do specification grading on some assignments, or certainly mastery learning. You could do with some things. So there's lots of ways of of doing this in small steps without necessarily fully committing to an ungrading approach. Yeah. Try it, see how it works, and if it works well, you can expand it. Okay. Well, thank you. And if you do any of these things and you'd like to present on it at a future workshop, it would be really great to hear how it went. And what I've been hoping is that we get a number of people playing with alternatives and coming back and reporting as a group on how it worked. And we had talked about trying to put that together this year, but we, we haven't had that many people. Yeah. And, and we were a little concerned about Maggie's state, whether she would yeah. be available <laughs> <laughs> at this time. Uh, because she has a due date on Saturday, Saturday. I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, so. We are okay well, thank you bye bye bye